it's so funny a comic's brain is so different than an than a pedestrian's brain and like what you know like i can't help i went pedestrian to a, is so funny by the way oh my <laughs> saying that i said i said to a woman i said to a woman the other it's day it's better than civilian yeah. that drives me crazy it's like we're not in the armed force let's react relax. there's a lot of people that, that overuse that <laughs> really civilian. Do. it's like we are <laughs> so lucky we get to do this bullshit yeah. any person on the street i respect more than even my favorite comic yeah. let's put let's get that out there is that like we 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 give so much less to society than a, a janitor yeah. <laughs> you know it's a strange thing to observe two aesthetically challenged individuals who have shared success in the same industry but seem to have two completely different understandings of how and why they got there and what it all means. Bert Kreischer could not have brought up his comedy brain theory to a worse person. Stavros is known and loved by many for his candidness and comfort in his own skin. From the outside, it seems like he knows who he is, what he is, and why he does the things he does. But Bert seems to be a symptom of a cultural problem that regular viewers of this channel will recognize as the Rogan effect, this is basically a derivative of the Dunning-Kruger effect depicted in this graph and evidently just as untreatable. As you can see, victims of the Dunning-Rogan effect display excessive amounts of confidence matched with low levels of knowledge and or competence. Bert Kreischer is going to make a few appearances in this video because he's probably the most delusional famous comedian in the world, and aside from ridiculing him just for fun, I think he offers a deep philosophical insight into the comedy brain that he's now famous for, except it's not for the reasons that he thinks. You know what we do? We give that person that's going through the hardest day of their life, we give them a moment of, of yeah, reprise. Yeah. yeah, we do that, but let's stop. Here's the thing that drives me crazy with comedians. It's like, that's not why you do it. No. You, know, you do it because it's a lot better than being a paralegal. You know what I mean? Yeah. You do it because you can, you can get rich, get pussy, and just never have to and write a spreadsheet again for the rest of your life and no and one's ne- gonna f- drug test you yeah yeah yes exactly sleep in get f- up let's all relax with the i just do it to put a smile on someone <laughs> no you did it at least for me i did it because when i was 19 this is how i got my d- sucked yeah. and then and then it's been 15 years and i have no other skills that's why i do it <laughs> and I don't, I- do you find yourself in that situation often where you speak before you actually think like you you promise something yes that yeah, and does that come with being a comedian where it's like you you Dude, my only goal is to lighten your day mm. i'm not you i'm not going to prove anything i can't i have nothing to prove <laughs> let's all relax with the I just do it to put a smile on someone. No, you did it. At least for me, I did it because when I was 19, this is how I got my d- sucked. And then, and then it's been 15 years and I have no other skills. That's why I do it. And I don't, I- so clearly that conversation with Stavros had no lasting impact on Bert, which again is consistent with the Dunning-Rogan effect. Lacking self-awareness is also a symptom of having excessive confidence with low competence. But let's move away from Bert for the moment, don't worry, we'll come back to him later, because if you thought this illness was concentrated to Rogan's close inner circle, you'd be sadly mistaken. It's hard to pinpoint exactly how or when this virus travelled abroad, but there's an increasing amount of evidence that it's now a global issue. I think we're going through a golden period, but maybe it's just beginning. Comedy's quite a new medium anyway. Yeah. We get to be the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, or certainly someone in our generation does. Mm-hmm. You know, if you think about it like George Carlin and, and uh, uh, Richard Pryor were John the Baptist, mm. or someone's coming through. It's like that thing of like, it feels like it's, it's getting bigger and bigger. Something is certainly getting bigger and bigger, so he's not entirely wrong. But if you missed my video on Jimmy Carr's appearance on JRE, here's a quick recap of his grand idea for stand-up comedy. My vision is it gets taught in schools. So mm. we, teach, we teach music and we teach drama and art. And I think stand-up comedy is an art form. And I think we need to get less, less magical thinking and more, okay, let's put down a language like music. You can write it. Mm-hmm. Let's come up with the, I mean, I, I kinda, I'm working on like 50 joke types, but let's come up with a, a way of analyzing this and teach people how to do it. Because what does it give you? Like if your kid does stand-up comedy, Okay, well, it's they have to find their voice. Uh, they have to look at things in a, in a from a different angle, a different perspective. It's about pattern recognition. 
These are all transferable skills. Mm. And it's about finding your voice. The reason every stand-up is interesting to watch is because it's individual voices. Yes. And really, what's growing up about? What's school about? Finding your voice. Finding yeah. out what you're about. Finding out who you are. Like, I don't think it's a dumb idea to teach stand-up comedy and to say, well, everyone should give this a go. All right, let's get serious for a second because I actually think this is really interesting. Have you noticed there's a tendency of successful people to almost reverse engineer their success into clear and concise points that are easy to understand and digest by those of us who are less fortunate? It's like they reach a point where they stop and think, why am I so successful? Why am I so rich? Well, I must be able to explain it, right? Otherwise, it could just be based on luck or being at the right place at the right time. Let me give you an example. Have you seen those clips about the characteristics of the rich? It might be something like, five things all billionaires do every day. And one of the points will be like waking up at 4am. All rich and successful people make the most of their days and wake up early to maximize their productivity. Blah, blah, blah. Now, is it possible that if you're a billionaire, you kind of have to wake up super early? I mean, there's obviously a lot going on in your life. There's so much to manage. There's so much to do. It actually kind of makes sense that you'd get up so early. Think about Mark Zuckerberg. From most accounts, he was a lazy slob at Harvard. But now that he's one of the richest men in the world, he gets up super early, he's disciplined, every hour of his day is accounted for, he does Brazilian jiu-jitsu, and he just ruptured his ACL. Good job, Zuck. But that's such a common theme with rich and successful people. Once they achieve it, all of a sudden they're here to try sell you their good habits. A morning walk is a non-negotiable. As soon as I'm up, I'm making a beeline for daylight or as close to daylight or sunlight as I can get. No caffeine for the first 90 minutes, salt in water, so I use Element, which is just tastes fantastic. Your adrenal system is what's active for the first 90 minutes of the day. Your adenosine system that caffeine acts on isn't. So having a morning coffee is literally pointless. You just- It destroys you in the afternoon. Correct. That walk, get back. Breath work, use State app, which is $1.50 a month. It's really great. It programs in progressive overload. Really, really fantastic. Four pathways, super simple. Then meditate. If I'm doing guided, I'm using Waking Up by Sam Harris. If I'm doing unguided, I use Insight Timer, which is just like a, a meditation timer app. And I'll read for about 10 to 15 minutes. And this is usually the same unless I'm traveling or, or, or I've got different stuff. Now, look, let me be clear about something. I'm sure doing most of those things is very healthy and good for your mind and it'll help you to maximize your day, blah, blah, blah. But who's got the time for all of that? He literally just outlined a two-hour morning routine. Throw in a normal job, a couple of kids and a mortgage, and you're faced with a completely different reality. My point is, most of these guys didn't start doing these things until they became successful and had the time and money to do them. How many times have we heard Rogan waxing lyrical about the benefits of having an ice bath and a sauna? The guy's got a personal gym at home and at his studio. So fair enough if you're able to do these things, but are we really going to sit here and pretend that anyone who wants to be successful like them needs to adopt that lifestyle? And it's exactly the same with these comedians. They found enormous success and now they're trying to explain it to us, or maybe they're trying to explain it to themselves. But can I just say this podcast, Protect Our Parks, has some of the biggest specials around. Mine was huge last year. Shane's is going to be huge. Mark Norman's top 10 for two weeks on Netflix. We're just waiting for yeah. one more member. Oh, you f***ing hack. When's this coming? <laughs> Where right? is it? I don't know. I haven't even thought about it. What? Come what? on. Because wow. wow. I've just been writing new material and f***ing around. All right. That's probably a good move. I'm, I'm so <laughs> busy right now. I yeah. just like right now I like doing whatever the f I feel like doing. So here we are, balls deep in Rogan's comedy ecosystem. He's got the biggest podcast in the world, which he skillfully used to create a golden age of mediocre comedians selling out arenas. I can't imagine trying to break into comedy. Like if you're a young comic working this, watching this right now, man, I I wouldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wouldn't. It's too it's too saturated. It's too man, I got in when no one knew you could make a living doing comedy. I got in I got into the gold rush of comedy. Like I got in when like I'm doing arenas. I shouldn't do arenas. Like not that like there's by the way, there's like ten of us doing arenas. There's never been an arena comic before. It was Dice, it was Dane, it was Steve Martin, and that made sense. They were the greatest mm. and now it's like me tommy uh sebastian schultz uh rogan Chappelle, uh dl hugh chris like every, there's a lot chris rock i mean you you could throw a stick in, at, at a comedy club and you're gonna hit an arena act sorry i forgot to mention this earlier 
One of the other symptoms of the Dunning-Rogan effect is rewriting history to overstate your current success. Let me explain. What is the highest grossing stand-up comedy special in history? Well, according to Bert Kreischer, it's one of his comedy brain buddies, right? Well, no, he'd be wrong. Have you heard of a guy called Eddie Murphy? His 1987 comedy special Raw is the highest grossing comedy special in history. It made over $50 million at the box office in 1987. And when you adjust that for inflation, in 2023 terms, that's almost $150 million. Now, I get that it was a different time back then, the media landscape was different, and it's hard to compare with today's comedy specials being released on Netflix and Amazon, etc. But Eddie Murphy's comedy specials, Raw and Delirious, were absolute game changers. I mean, these were cultural phenomenons. People were flocking to the movie theaters to watch some dude standing on a stage telling jokes. Today, that doesn't seem so crazy, but 35 years ago, that wasn't really something that people did regularly. I remember sitting in a in a in a hallway and we were talking about our buses and it transitioned into private jets. Like what best? Like what are, are you? How what midsize do you like flying the best? Mm. And it, and that's comedy. That <laughs> that's comedy. That's just stand up comedy. That never happened. Okay, so now Bert's really going deep into delusional darkness, and it's this whole idea that there are these comics making millions of dollars just from their stand up comedy shows. But nothing could be further from the truth. How many of Bert's top tier comedy buddies don't have a regular podcast of their own and also don't have a regular spot on JRE? Zero. That's how many. What he's really describing is a comedy ecosystem that has its roots in Rogan's podcast and the enormous popularity that it has. I was talking to a comic the other day and he's like, your stage setup, how much does it cost? What do you travel with? I travel with five tour buses. I have, it's like 1.7 for a month is what I pay for my state. Like, we're, it's it's such a huge business that if you're a guy who just wants to make people laugh, you have to, one, negotiate the open mic scene, which is insane. Just getting out of an open mic scene and getting to the next level is crazy. That's like little baby turtles have a better chance making it to the ocean, right. making it to deep water than a stand, than an open micer does getting out of a comedy scene. Then you have to get into the clubs and we haven't even got you into Hollywood yet. Now you got to go to Hollywood and try to pitch a show and see if you're actually likable. I mean, this is, there are so many hurdles to get through that then you go, Oh, you'd got to start a podcast. You got to have a social media presence. You got to have a social media team. Do you have a producer who's doing your content for you? Oh, by the way, your digital footprint needs to be this, and that's going to cost you ten thousand dollars a month. Where's that ten thousand dollars from? You're not getting it from stand up. I mean, dude, I run a business, and I and I, I run a fairly successful business, and I am one of the biggest comics in the world, and I'm still going like. I'm checking, making sure I'm paying my overhead. Like, I, it's crazy. And as per usual, he forgot to mention the one major ingredient in his cocktail of BS, being buddies with Joe Rogan. Is there a, like a side of that that's really cool that comedy has gotten so widely oh, adapted? Oh, yeah, yeah, that, yeah, 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 yeah. That Don't get me wrong. The, the problems that comedians face is like, which jets they're going to fly on, is, is that's kind of awesome. Dude, we're sitting at the Gorge. We, I was the first comedy show at the Gorge. Uh, seats... 32,000. We got probably 20 in there. It's all sitting in the infield, all into carved out rock, overlooking a huge gorge where the sun sets behind you. I'm sitting with Big J, Mark Norman, Andrew Santino. I'm, I'm, we're all these comics, the 10, 10 of the funniest dudes I know in the world and women. And they're, and one, and someone just looks and goes, we just tell jokes. Like that's it. And, and, but comedy's at a place now yeah. where you, you're doing these arenas and 20,000 people are showing up just to see comedy. And, and, and it's insane. So this cult of celebrity comedy podcasters really did blow up during the last three years since the events of 2020, when most of us were forced to stay at home and consume more social media than we usually would. That's where many of these guys were discovered and blew up. Bert talks about this idea of being famous only for your stand-up comedy routines, but I don't think it's that simple. Take Matt Rife, for example. He's been grinding it out at comedy clubs doing his stand-up routines just like most comics do. But then he blew up on TikTok for his crowd work clips, and now he's selling out venues and doing world tours just like the big boys. But not many of us would know who he is if it wasn't for social media and, of course, podcasting. It strikes me that what you do, especially on the podcast, but really live as well, yeah. is you've got 
the barrier between who you are mm -hmm. and what you bring the audience. So you treat the audience as friends. Yeah. And I think you get all of that back. Yes. Because mm -hmm. they, they go, oh, he's not, he's not going, I'll tell this joke in the green room, but this isn't for Gen Pop. Right. Right. For sure. It's like, it's really nice. It's, it's a real intimacy to laughter. There like is. if you think about what we're doing. Yeah. We're letting people go in our heads and we're going in their bodies. Yeah. Whoa. We're changing their physiology. We're changing their, their vagus nerve Dude. is like, uh, like we're changing it. They're yeah. laughing, but they're releasing dopamine and, yes. and, and serotonin and they feel great after the show. They do. And, yeah. they're, they're, and, and it's performative, right? Yes. Being in an audience is performative. We think we're the only ones performing because we're dummies. There's a thousand, two thousand people out there what? and they're all performing. I don't think I've ever heard anyone make laughing at a joke sound so complicated. I mean, the mental gymnastics that these guys do to inflate their sense of self-worth and self-importance is truly entertaining within itself. Now, earlier on in the video, I played a couple of clips from Jimmy Carr's appearance on JRE, and he also made an appearance on YMH in that same week, but we only just got it a few days ago because of YMH's practice of banking episodes. And similar to his JRE appearance, Jimmy Carr continued his desperate analysis of the comedy scene, and it took on an interesting twist when they started complaining that modern movies just aren't really art anymore, you know, compared to stand-up comedy. But now it, it really is just about the single. Like they, people, people don't really <sighs> reference like, oh, have you heard this album? They just, it's about a hit that streams and, and, that, and that's movies it. now. When was the last time you saw a real movie as opposed to something with goodies and baddies? Oh, for that's a kid's sake. film. Yes. That's a kid's film. Yeah, like a, a, a film that takes you on some type of journey emotionally. Yeah. It has like a, a real arc to it. You look at what's out, a lot of times you're like, this is all bullshit. It's they all bullshit because it's movies. profitable. Because it's it's got a foundation of being profitable in the past. So they just yeah, remake they just, the same shit. Yeah. And also we're They in don't our, take risks at all. No, studios. there's no more. So let me just get this straight. Tom Segura is complaining about new movies being boring, overly predictable, and lacking depth. But he spent the last year ramming his buddy's machine movie down our throats. You see, everything they do is art, but when it's somebody else doing it, well, it becomes shallow garbage. And speaking of shallow garbage, this next clip actually happened, like in real life. This conversation was actually recorded and released for public viewing. I had a hair transplant and I got my teeth you done. Did you? Yeah. Looks great. It does Thank look great. You. Dang. That's pretty good, isn't it? Where'd you have it done? Turkey? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, <laughs> this guy. I had it done by this guy at the Maitland Clinic called Ed Balls, who's, who's really good. How much panic when it's done where you're like, is this going to suck? Yeah. Do you have, like, right? Where you're oh, like, yeah, I might look like uh, crazy. Because you but see you guys get your with teeth the bad ones, well, the next day like... you kind of go, is this okay? Yeah, 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 yeah. Is this okay? Did I go too white? I always think I didn't go white enough. Actually, oh, yeah, me too. No. I, I want it to look like someone opened a fridge. Let no. me see. <laughs> no, They're good. Dude. No, those no. are great. Those guys stand out and they look fucking weird, dude. Are they veneers? You, huh? Oh, I got everything done. My dentist described it as a mouth. Yeah. I went, I want all 30, because I didn't have that much time but off. Can so I, I tell said, you something? I want the, every teeth done. Yeah. We talk about this all the time. The wisest thing you did was not go too white. Yeah, Don't you go can go. Those people do it. You see it all the time and you see it like people who are on camera and you're like. Ah, uh, you can take the comedian out of LA, but you can't take the cringe out of the comedian. And so there's this clash between new school and old school. And never was it on better display than when Dave Chappelle had no idea who Andrew Schultz was. So Schultzy turned his podcast into a therapy session to cope with the heartbreak. He said, okay, I can't do stand-up, but this isn't stand-up. So I shouldn't do stand-up like this because there's no audience. So the key to this, and he figured it out. He's like, the key to this is you got to hit it fast. The punchlines have to come one after the other. after the other. It's got to be fast-paced and with images. So like he would use all these visuals while he was hitting punchline after punchline. Oh, wow. He, he figured out a new way to do comedy. He figured out a way to do in internet Instagram 10 minute comedy. But that's not, like you say, that's not stand up. No. Like, like this thing that you're describing, God bless him. Yeah. That's not what I do. Yeah, it's different. Uh, yeah. It's different. But, you know, I could throw a slide showing the if I want to, but that crowd's not there. What's right. the f point for me? <laughs> I know what you mean, but for him, he's coming up still. Yeah, and it's it's a whole different ball of wax. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Like that thing that he was, that evolution he was able to make, mm -hmm. that's. I'm, I'm like the old guy who has that hot outfit from the 70s. Go fashion, go on without me. I look fine. I'm that. I'm, I'm good. We're out there in Arizona. We're cooling, chilling by the pool. And all of a sudden, people start hitting me up. They're like, yo, 
Chappelle's on Rogan and he's he's uh he's hating you on you, bro. He's throwing throwing shade at you, right? Let me just give some context to this. I think I would have reacted the same way as Dave, given how I was described. Mm -hmm. Joe's describing this like kind of YouTube or Instagram comedy, and you know how we all are. The second yeah. you told me about like a funny YouTuber or a funny Instagrammer, yeah, we're like, I don't give a what that shit is a little slideshow yeah. we stand-ups yeah exactly we're stand-ups so it's just like i understand that first reaction yeah right but then when joe's like no he's a stand-up it's it's different and he's he found a way to evolve within the times and then i think he was a little bit dismissive to it and he was like that's not my type of comedy that's not what i do and i guess the only pushback i would give there to dave is that like dave is a household name not because of stand-up yeah. But because of a different type of comedy. I think the takeaway from this is I'm not going to get a Chappelle chain anytime soon. <laughs> and, uh, and you know what? I can live with that. I think I'll be okay. You know, and if, if Dave wants to rethink that, then, um, you know, we can have that discussion. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, these are the brats of comedy, the social media influencer stand up comedians who most of us came to know from their appearances on JRE. So, what about guys like Dave Chappelle and Bill Burr? Well, I think they're both great examples of almost the exact opposite of the comedy brats. Rogan needs those two more than they need him. They validate him as a comedian. And you can see that dynamic when they go on JRE. Instead of comedy brats acting like lovesick puppies in front of Papa Rogan, Chappelle and Bill Burr can basically say whatever they want, and Rogan has no choice but to put on a brave face and laugh hysterically, because they're comedians, right? You want people to walk down the street with a mask on? Let's not start this, John. Do you, though? Let's not start this. Okay. Let's, let's start it. I, I don't want to start this bullshit. I'm not going to sit here with no medical degree, listening to you with no medical degree, with an American flag behind you, smoking a cigar, <laughs> acting like we know what's up better than the CDC. All I do is I listen. I watch the news once every two weeks. I'm like, eh, eh, mask or no mask? Still mask? All right, mask. That's all I give a f*** about. I don't care. But even they say you shouldn't wear a mask unless you're treating a coronavirus patient. The World Health Organization. Yeah, but they didn't say that, that initially. They didn't say it initially. No, they didn't. They did. And then it gradually, then it gradually, and then, wait, wait, wait. And then everybody wore the f***ing masks. This is like rollerblading. Everybody f***ing rollerbladed. And then there was that one f***ing homophobic joke. And then everybody acted like they never did it. <laughs> and then a, a hundred million f***ing rollerblades got thrown into the f***ing ocean. We all wore masks. And I then all of a sudden, people are f***ing sitting there. What? You don't have the body type for it, dude. <laughs> <laughs> knuckles would scrape on the ground <laughs> even with that extra two inches <laughs> i just love how wearing a mask became like this like soft thing that you were doing like yeah, being courteous bitches. being courteous what is it for bitches? It i know it's so stupid a mask. <coughs> first of all oh not... god you're so tough with your open nose and throat <laughs> gee joe and your five o'clock shadow this is a man right here a oh, man doesn't wear a mask there's probably a handful of people that can go on JRE and speak to him like that. I mean, putting aside the fact that Burr was having a laugh and they're old buddies, he was roasting him plain and simple. He insulted Joe's intelligence, his height, the way he talks. Man, that's a classic. But this is what it looks like when someone doesn't quite have the same sway with Rogan. Another classic. Pharmaceutical companies have done the same thing. It was revealed sure. in the WikiLeaks memos. See, this is where, where I was saying, it was, don't hold care on, about don't this. interrupt me, you f so there's definitely a social hierarchy in the Rogan universe. He changes his demeanor depending on his guest, which I think most people do, so we shouldn't be too harsh on him for that. But we've heard the many, many stories of how Rogan has encouraged his friends to take up comedy and start a podcast. There's the failed Brendan Schraub experiment, which is still going. Bert Kreischer considers himself one of the biggest and best comedians in the world, bragging about selling out arenas, his fleet of comedy tour buses, the big payroll he's got to take care of. Stand-up comedy is a big business these days, guys, thanks to Rogan. And even the more talented of the comedy brats, Tom Segura and, to an extent, Andrew Schultz, these guys didn't just get big from one appearance on JRE. It was multiple appearances over several years that really cemented their status as Brogan comedians. And hey, I'm not saying these guys are complete hacks. I mean, Tom Segura used to be a great stand-up comedian. I almost feel bad including him with the others, but he's taken such a big turn lately, leaning into this unfunny rich guy motivational Andrew Tate light version of himself, and it's becoming harder and harder to enjoy his comedy as a result. The endless podcasts of these guys explaining to us the nuances of their comedy brilliance, 
It's becoming insufferable. But at the end of the day, people are still buying tickets to their shows, and even though their podcast numbers are falling off, they're still turning up every week and speaking into the mic. So until we all stop listening and move on to bigger and better things, the comedy brats will still be here loud and proud and full of gas. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this breakdown of the Rogan effect on the comedy world. Drop a comment below, let me know what you guys think about all of this, and if you haven't subscribed yet, consider jumping on board so you get all my uploads in your feed. That's it from me. I'll catch you guys in the next one. Mm -hmm. It's all incredible. The idea that we're literally living off our wits. Yes. Uh, it's and how few of us there are. I mean, there's, there's no one doing this. That's why I think it's like virgin territory. Oh my God, the power went out. <laughs>